Johnny and Dolly. The team is supported by ableauctions.ca. Closing your business? We can help. And King of Floors, your vinyl, laminate, and engineered flooring superstore. I have to admit that, um, yeah, into the Delaney's OK Tire and Langley inbox, a lot of support for Ryan, uh, who yeah. thinks refereeing in the NHL is an easy job. Okay, it is Friday, which means uh, all of our Friday guests are uh, brought to you by Langley Chrysler. They have the vehicle for your next summer adventure. Whether you need a Jeep for the beach or a Ram for the fam, you can uh, save up to twelve grand online or on land at langleychrysler.com. Uh, we're going to be joined now by Rick Bonus, Dallas Stars head coach, member of the Canucks staff when they went to the 2011 Stanley Cup Final 10 years ago this month. Um, has been a head coach with uh, five teams, associate coach with the Tampa Bay Lightning, yep. uh, a model franchise in the National Hockey League. And uh, Rick was there recently under under John Cooper. Rick, uh, thanks for doing this. How are you, sir? I'm doing great, thank you. How are you guys today? Very uh, good, Rick. Very, very well. Vancouver says hi, Rick. Hey, um, uh, how would you describe it? Uh, I, I don't want to get you into trouble here, but our first segment was all about uh, officiating. How would you describe uh, uh, the state of officiating in the National Hockey League, and how, how difficult of a job do you think it is? Well, I think you just answered it. And I heard someone say earlier on the program, it is, it is a very difficult job, and it is. And from a coaching perspective, we always um, <laughs> we always love them when we're getting power plays and get mad at them when we're giving we're killing penalties. Uh, and listen, it's it's an, it's a very tough job, and it's magnified now today because the game is so fast, mm -hmm. and it's impossible. Even with the two referee system, again, the, the game is so fast. I, I know it's impossible for these guys to stay on top of everything because, and I can say that because. But when we see a penalty that we think shouldn't be called, we can go on our video and we can do an overhead and yeah. we can almost see where the referees are looking at the time of the infraction. And sometimes they're just not looking at the right way. That, well, that's no one's fault. That's just, again, that's human nature and that's the speed of the game. But we have that luxury to do that. So when we get mad that, geez, they missed a call, what are they looking at? Then we go back to our video and, and we honestly, we find out what the, where they're looking. Mm -hmm. and, and and most times um, they're looking the other way or there's times where they're looking right at it and okay now they got to make a quick judgment call and we're going to disagree with one when they don't call it and agree with one when they do it for us so it's an incredibly difficult job all I know is is I and I have a pretty good rapport with all of them and I know they're doing the best job they can out there and, and that's all you can ask from anyone it's easy one thing I noticed, and I, and I brought this up to Judy, what we're watching the games on TV, and I'm saying, you know what? This is an awful easy game from watching here. Right? <laughs> you get behind the bench, or you get on the ice surface, and then you feel and you see the speed of the game, and guys are skating in front of you, and, and that's what happens to the referees. And on the bench, as a coach, guys are standing up to change, and, you, and it's impossible to see everything because the, uh, the guys are so big. So... There, listen, there's there's a lot of things involved with these guys. All I can tell you is I agree that it's a very difficult job, but I do know in their hearts they're doing the best they can, and that's all you can ask for. I know I'm talking around you. No, no. You're it's, coming over with the right answer, but that's how I feel. Rick, um, there's a million subjects we could bring up with you, but you mentioned something there, the speed of the game. You've been in the National Hockey League in some capacity, first as a player since 1975-76. That season, you're pushing ha half a century. Just, can you put it into perspective just how much the game has changed in terms of speed? Well, it, it, it goes to a couple of factors, and one is, is first of all, their off-ice conditioning. Uh, the programs are far more intensive now than they were back in the 70s. They're also a lot longer. Like if you, if you look at our at our club, we finished uh, what May 10th, so the guys get a couple of weeks uh, just to relax and chill out and and, and you know, but wounds. But then they're getting a warm up to the yep. to the workouts. So we used to start probably in August. Well, now they're starting. So our group started end of May. And, and so their, their, their workouts are far more strenuous, far more specific to hockey. We used to read, they tell us, don't do squats, don't do leg stuff, just do bench press. Well, you know, your, the power in hockey comes from your legs. 
regardless how much you can bench press. And so the, 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 the programs today are far more intense. And, and also the kids today, they're, they're juniors. They're, they're, they're being educated in junior nutrition and, and the importance of workout. So they're starting to work out a lot younger than we did, and they're working out a lot harder, and they look after themselves. But the, the other side of that, it, it's such a big business today, right? It wasn't so much a business back in the 70s and 80s from a player's perspective. Now, now the guys are making so much money, and there's so much on that state for these guys that, that it, they are paying far more attention to their nutrition and to their conditioning. And that leads into the way the game is played, which is so much faster. The shifts, the shift length is a major factor. Now coaches are telling players, go hard 35, 45 seconds and get off. Whereas before, you were never told that. And if you were out there for a minute and a half, like that's the way you used to take it, right? <laughs> no one said anything because that was just accepted. Well, now if you... If, if you see a guy that's been out there for a minute, you will see an incredible drop off in his performance. And that's why uh, the coaches, we, we, we keep preaching 40, 45, 35 seconds, get off. And we're making quicker changes than they used to do. And, uh, and get guys off a lot quicker at base offs. So there, there's a lot involved, but there's just no, this game is, is two to three times a lot faster than it was even not that long ago. Eric, you you got a defenseman, Miro Heiskanen. Uh, there's Kale McCarr in Vancouver. We got a, a really good defenseman, Quinn Hughes. Adam Fox is out there. So many good young defensemen, Rick, uh, in the NHL right now. Um, what's happening there? How are they developing these uh, good defensemen who are coming in and playing at a young age and producing at a young age? Well, the four names you mentioned, there's not one of them that you would say, okay, there's a big physical defenseman. None of those guys are physical. They're all great skaters. Uh, they all think the game very well. They see the game very well. And they play a different game than they were before. We were always the defensive before. Get three big physical guys so they can bang guys in the corner, bang guys in front of the net, and, and win all those battles. These, those four guys you mentioned are all quick. They're great skaters. They have great vision. They have good sticks defensively, but they're not going to go in and win too many battles in the corner, and they're not going to win too many battles in front of the net. So they offset that by being a very offensive-minded guys. Um, but again, so that's that's every team needs those guys. And the focus now, and because the game is so well coached, every team that's going to win and be successful has to have scoring from the back end. They have to be a big part of your offense and joining the rush uh, and leading the rush at times and making those outlet passes. So the focus on a lot of teams now is, is to get guys like that. Now you, you need a good balance. You need those big physical defensemen as well. And preferably you can, you know, the, the also elite players, you're going to get both. But so you do need both. You still need those big defensemen to win some battles and win some battles in front of the net, but you need your defense to be part of your offense. It's huge. And, it, it, again, the game is so well coached, and it goes back to the speed of the game. Everyone's back pressuring now. They're getting out the neutral zone clogged up differently than the old trap ways. It's just pressure. Um, so you need your defense involved. And the only way you're going to get your defense involved is getting the mobility, the creativity, and the skills that the four guys you mentioned have. We're talking with Rick Bonus of the Dallas Stars. Uh, Rick, uh, moving on to what's uh, happening these days in the National Hockey League, the playoffs. Uh, Braden Point now has 11 uh, goals, leading the National Hockey League in playoff scoring. His uh, stats the last two years in the postseason, most important time of year, are just so impressive. Now, you were with Tampa Bay in 2016. Uh, that was Braden Point's first season. He was a, he was a third-round pick. Uh, take us back uh, to that point and, and just tell us how much he took you by surprise and your staff well so you're going into training camps even then um it's not that long ago that you, yeah. you project your what your lineup is going to look like uh, before camp starts you say okay this is probably what we're going to look at when the season starts and in saying that you're always hoping that someone's going to come into camp and light it up and lighten your eyes. And Braden Point did that. When we went into training camp that year, uh, and I'm, I know I'm getting old and my memory's probably not as sharp as it once was, but I, I, I do recall that the plan for Braden going into camp, he would start in Syracuse. It would be a great mm -hmm. start for him. He came into training camp and played so well and was so noticeable, there was no chance in heck we could send him down. 
this done. Yeah. And you're talking about a great kid. Braden Point is, as a coach, you, you, you love these low maintenance guys, right? They just yeah. show up every day. They're like the twins. The twins, they just show up every yeah. day. They work their butt off. They're a great example for everyone else. Never, never said boo. Braden Point is like that. He just comes to the rink every day. Does he's a very quiet kid, and he just works his butt off. And if there, there will be a day when he will lead this league in scoring. And you just saw progression in his ability, his confidence. He is an elite player. He is right up there with those guys, the elite players in the league. There's no question in my mind. You, he is a, to me, he's always been a smaller version than Nate McKinnon. Nate's mm-hmm. bigger, but the speed and the way they can handle the puck at top speed and make plays at top speed and see the ice at top speed, Braden Point is right in there with all those guys. And it wouldn't shock me. Uh, to see him lead the league in scoring one day. He and Cooch, and Kucherov is another example. He just shows up, works his butt off, doesn't say a word. He's the first guy on the ice working with his skills uh, and, and working, and after practice. And now Braden's followed his, his, his tendencies and his habits. So uh, there, there's been a lot of good influence on Braden in that organization, Stan Coach, Victor Hedman, couldn't ask for better people, right? But he's, he's smart enough. Uh, to just watch and learn, doesn't talk, just goes out and keeps getting better. I love the kid, and he is an elite player. Uh, the number one reason we got you on, first of all, we love talking to you, but uh, secondly, um, the 2011 Stanley Cup uh, Finals, uh, 10 years ago this month, Canucks losing seven to the Boston Bruins. You were part of the uh, Canucks staff. What are your memories of that uh, Stanley Cup Final, and does it still hurt? Oh, yeah, it's painful. <laughs> It's painful. Judy and I were talking about that the other night. Um, it's just, you know, we played so well at home, and, and it was unreal. The, the, the three, well, three games prior to Game 7, the three games at home, we just played so well. And I know we won a game in overtime, and they were very low scoring. We just didn't have the same. Um, we just didn't play the same when we went into Boston. We fell behind early, and we couldn't get caught up. Some of that, a lot of that was the goaltender, Thomas, right? He was phenomenal that whole series. Uh, he, and he, won the, he won the Conn Smite that year. Yep. He was outstanding. Uh, but we went into Boston, and they just played a different game than they did in Vancouver. So now you get into a game seven, and, hey, all bets are off. Remember that fluky goal they got to, yep. to open up the scoring in the second period? It was just, just a play from behind the net. But getting that close and having that good a team and the great characters on that team, the, the, the Twins and Louie and... Kessler and Bieksa and Hammer, and all, all those guys, just wonderful, wonderful guys that you want to go to war with every night. And it, it, so we had that kind of atmosphere around the hockey club, and, and that's what made yep. it special. The team was at the end of that game, losing that at home in front of our rabid, rabid, and fantastic fans in Vancouver. That hurts, and that'll hurt to the day I die. I'll tell you that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, Rick, uh, very quickly, 30 seconds or, or less. We haven't talked about the Stars. You make it to the Stanley Cup final uh, last year. Uh, you don't make the playoffs this time around. Uh, again, quickly, what was, the, what was the difference this time around? Oh, listen, we, we had three different training camps because of the COVID break we had. Mm-hmm. Then we had the ice storm. We lost nine days. And all of a sudden, we had the injuries. We had key, key injuries. to our. We never had our number one goalie. And the injuries, Rupe Hintz played on one leg. We didn't have Sedan. We didn't have Radula. So we were pretty much in every game. And if you look at our overtime record, 14 losses in overtime in shootouts. Sedan, a healthy Rupe Lins, and Radula make a difference, as does, as does Ben Bishop in the shootout and the overtime. So the injuries played a big part of it. But we went through what the Canucks went through. You lose part of your schedule. And now it's condensed. And when you get into that, there's no time to rest properly and there's absolutely zero time to practice. We went 11 weeks of six games every week, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday, 11 straight weeks. We didn't have a practice that whole time. We'd have a couple of morning mm-hmm. skates, but we had to keep the guys off the ice just so they were fresh. Vancouver had that. They came out of that break. They had great energy early. And then all of a sudden the games just catch up to you. And the lack of rest and the lack of practice time and, People think it's an excuse. It's not an excuse. It's what we had to deal with. And I, gave, and I said this at the end of the year. I give our, our guys a lot of credit. They worked their tails off all year. And that was as a, 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 a crazy a season as I've ever been through. We thought the bubble was crazy. Well, this, this was worse. So there's a, there's a lot of reasons, but I'm proud of the way we played, and I know we're helping next year. We're going to get right back in the mix. 
Rick, uh, this has been fabulous. Thanks so much for this. Uh, all, all the best. All right, man. Nice talking to you guys. Take care. Hello, Vancouver. Yes. <laughs> Hello, back. Thanks, thanks, thanks Rick. Rick. I appreciate it.